meeting. Tonight's meeting is Trade Unions in the Modern Epoch. And my name's Dave Buxton. I'm a Labour Party member in Newham in East London and a member of Unite Community. I previously worked in local government for 28 years and prior to that I worked in construction. And uh, before we get going proper, um, Roger would like just to have a couple of minutes to say a few words. Um, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say um, I need to correct a couple of mistakes in the notice that was sent out. Um, first of all, you, you know, one of our speakers who we're very pleased to welcome is Steve McKenzie, who is a scourge of all union bureaucrats, but I put him down as a member of um, Unison by mistake. He's a member of Unite. Mm. And uh, we're looking forward to his contribution, of course. There's also, in relation to the comrades who we're really proud to welcome from, uh, from Belarus, um, that's, um, that's Lisa Mer Melisavieta Merliak, International Secretary of the Independent Trade Union, and Yuri Ravavoy, uh, a member of the Independent Trade Union and of the Strike Committee of the Grodna uh, Enterprise. Um, now, in the notice, I put them down as uh, representing an organization called the BNP, which probably sent a few shivers down Comrade's spine. Um, that was a, a transliteration of the um, Belarusian name of their organization, which uh, I'm, I, I, uh, I'm going to have the nerve to try and say it. Belaruski Nesavisimi Prosayuz. How's that? Was that okay? Anybody who knows? <laughs> but anyway, that means the in, uh, Belarusian Independent Trade Union. Uh, so uh, it would be better known by the initials of the translated term BIT. And of course, there's also our friend Jabu of the Living Wage Campaign in Oxford. And uh, Jade, who is um, we're welcoming, who is as well as being um, an expert who led off at a recent meeting of ours on the uprising in uh, his native Lebanon. He's also working at the moment as an organizer for the International Workers of the World branch in, um, in Britain. So um, that's <clears throat> it, thank you. Okay, okay. So before we get started with the speakers, I thought I'd do a short introduction. Um, trade unions in the modern epoch have been dominated by neoliberal economics and at its heart has been to nullify or to neuter the trade union movement and in Britain in particular we had the miners strike which lasted over a year and the state mobilized all its resources to defeat the miners because in the 70s, the miners had given the government a bloody nose and defeated the employers and the government. And Thatcher and the Tories uh, wanted to take the miners on and to show the work, the organised working class, who was in in control. And unfortunately, the government and the the bosses won that struggle. And a series of other trade union struggles in Britain led to defeats. But that's part of a strategy of the ruling class to, to really weaken the trade union. So they also did that with legal impediments to make it far more difficult um, for unions to take organised strike action. And even up to recent years, there's still government, the Tory governments are still bringing legislation in to make it more difficult through larger percentages needed um, to ratify strike action and causing all sorts of delays so that effectively it gives the employer time to organize to undermine any strike action but despite all of this over the decades since the 1980s when new liberal economics has really grown throughout the world unions still have the ability to fight and defend their interests. And it, I think it's time that we have an appraisal of where the trade union movement is. 
particularly in this time of COVID-19 when the, what's the, uh, the unemployment levels are set to rise dramatically as the furlough scheme is, is brought to an end and replaced with a very ineffective scheme. Um, and then there's sick pay. If, if workers who are not under the furlough scheme or any other scheme have to rely on sick pay, that's totally inadequate. So a whole range of issues are brought to the fore of workers' minds. What, what's going to happen to us and who's going to speak on our behalf? Unfortunately, in Britain, we, we have Sir Keir Starmer, a member of the establishment, now leading the Labour Party. And there's no, very little coming out that sounds positive in favour of working class people. In fact, the main message is, is slight criticism of the government here and there, but the main message is we support the government in what it's doing. And that's totally inadequate. And, and as is the case on when elections have taken place and our class has not been successful, then workers have to turn to their trade unions. But trade unions need an effective strategy if, if they're going to succeed. And we have to say that um, the trade unions are hampered by, in many cases, a bureaucracy uh, over burden with uh, staff who are maybe can be effective but more often than not are not really effective and go through the motions and I was a member of Unison and I have to say I found them to be one of the most bureaucratic and difficult unions to deal with where you try to organize uh, action and it always had to go back through the full timer and the full timer would do exactly whatever they needed to do to stop that strike action from taking place. But that is not the whole picture. Um, now there is the rank and file that used to be part of the trade union movement that has also um, reduced in its influence and that's something we need to, to talk about. Is it possible to build rank and file organisations? Because when I was in construction I was a member of a rank and file group and we supported strike action uh, where it existed. We'd send uh, solidarity pickets to those, to those uh, picket lines. And it was about the rank and file taking action regardless of what the union leaders said. And that was effective up to a point, but unfortunately those rank and file groups were in the main um, fairly small, but could be influential at, at different times. So that's one, that's one um, possibility. And um, w there's also in Britain something called the National Shop Stewards Network. And I checked their website recently, and in September they had a pre-TUC meeting, at which they had about five very senior union officials. They had um, Baker's Union, Deputy General Secretary for Unite, um, I think they had education, so a number of uh, communication workers, but also they had rank and file workers as well talking about the struggles they were engaged in. And I remember a few years ago, I was particularly active in the National Shop Stewards Network. And I think that that sort of organization has a, has a, a real role to play as well. And I'd be very interested to hear from other countries the types of organisations that are outside the formal um, trade union structures, if you like, that tries to bring together activists and, and shop stewards. Now, I don't want to go back over history, but there was a very positive history of national shop stewards networks in the 20s and 30s, which were often influenced or led by the Communist Party, and they were very, very effective. And later still, there were combined groups of shop stewards committees across various industries, which again, took their own independent action, if you like, outside of the diktats of the, of the union leaders. But all of those, most of those traditions have been lost in recent generations, which is why we need to look 
discuss this subject of trade unions in, in the modern epoch. And I just want to draw attention to an author that I've become aware of recently, and I've mentioned her before, Jane McAvee. I think that's how you pronounce her. She's an American organiser who has published three books on the subject of, of organising and recruiting members. And uh, the key to her um, strategy, if you like, is that she says we need a organising proper method, which is, uh, contains a number of elements. One is to identify uh, natural leaders within groups. Now that may not be the elected shop steward, but it may be it's someone who the workers in, in any given workplace turn to um, as the natural leaders whenever there are issues that need to be discussed in terms of taking forward uh, the uh, issues within the workplace. Um, but she puts at the heart that the workers themselves must take the lead in any struggle and recognises that the trade unions can be bureaucratic, lead workers up the wrong path, undermine struggle, and she puts them at the forefront of, of recruitment, but organising and negotiating as well. And I have to say, on that question of negotiations with management, I have to mention my old union again, Unison, because whenever we were in a situation where it came to a critical point in negotiating with management, the regional organiser would step in and basically take control and determine where that negotiation would go. And more often than not, that led to a compromise with the employer, which was to the detriment of the employees, the union members. And the net effect of that, where instead of the workers having control of the agenda, leading the struggle or negotiations, is demoralisation. And then it's a vicious circle. And on top of that, um, there is the, um, the attitude of many union leaders about social um, dialogue with, uh, with the uh, employers. They see that as the main thing that they have if we enter, if they enter into discussions, be it at national or regional level with the employers, then they can be effective in terms of enhancing or defending the conditions of workers. However, that's predicated on the, the unions having the power through the action of their members to back that up. If there is nothing to back it up, then that social dialogue will lead nowhere or it will lead often to compromise and, and defeats in terms of the terms and conditions of workers. And, that's, and that power that the unions have in the social dialogue came from, uh, post the Second World War, came from decades of strike action by, by workers. And after the war, the employers, if you like, um, said, well, we need to address the militancy and power of the unions. And they came forward this idea of social dialogue uh, with the, the unions. And in some countries, like in Germany, they, they had uh, created works councils where they, you'd have people elected to the works councils and, and they became a, a dominant factor in the attitude of the union. So this social dialogue, where early on where it was based on the threat of strike action, probably led to some advances in terms of the terms and conditions. But as the years have gone on and workers have been defeated, then it's less and less effective, that social dialogue. So I think that's another issue that um, some some in the trade union movement recognise that we need to have more strike action. Uh, and as I mentioned, Jane McElvey, she actually, that's another essential part. And in one of her books, she talks about recruiting low paid uh, health workers, I was told to do this. low paid health workers uh, 
to the union where in in areas of america in the south where it was they had the lowest uh, um, rates of unionization in the country but through the methods that in she describes in her book and and strike action being a key component of it, they were able to recruit um, nurses and other uh, and low paid workers into unions. So these are the sorts of things I think we need to look at um, how the unions could be more effective to deal with uh, the problems in society. So we have a list of speakers, which I want to move on to now. And um, Steve McKenzie is the first on the list. He's a member of Unite. Are you there, Steve? I, I, yeah, I don't think I saw his name. I think he's here. I'm here. Oh. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, Steve. Right. Well, thanks for that introduction, Dave. How long have I got? How long would you like, Steve? About 20 minutes, that's all right. Okay. All right then. Right. No, Steve McKenzie. I'm a member of Unite at the moment. I've been a union rank and file activist for 40 years uh, mm -hmm. in six different trade unions, and in all but one, I've ended up fighting not just the employers, um, but the uh, bureaucracy as well for precisely the sort of reasons um, that Dave has uh, outlined. I hope I can do some uh, justice to this uh, uh, subject and uh, so I've sort of prepared a few uh, bits and pieces to say because you know the, the, the introduction that went out uh, to everyone made um, uh, the point that the membership of the uh, trade unions has declined um, over the last 40 years since the end uh, of the 1970s. In fact it's actually halved and if you look at the strike figures during the 70s and early 80s and um, the days lost were counted in millions. Um, they're, they're counted um, in tens of thousands and sometimes in, 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 in sort of um, years where there's a, a lot of action now in hundreds uh, of thousands. I think uh, there was one year when it went up um, to the millions um, and, and that was in 2000, never mind about pensions, so to speak. But <clears throat> more than anything, um, the, the, the most uh, devastating effect uh, uh, for the trade unions has been the demise of the shop stewards uh, uh, organisation um, because at the end of the 70s there was almost a quarter of a million uh, shop stewards uh, and today um, I think you'd be lucky to count them uh, in their tens uh, of uh, thousands. Also said the introduction um, to, to this meeting uh, and quite rightly so, that deindustrialisation and anti-union uh, legislation has uh, um, uh, played a big part uh, uh, in uh, that decline. And it also uh, makes reference to um, the bureaucratic uh, decay that has taken place. And I believe that the bureaucratic centralisation is uh, a reflection of the decline that has taken place as a result of the uh, setbacks uh, that we've uh, suffered. And I think now there is a need, a desperate need uh, to fight back because I think the situation that is developed, and Dave was quite right to point out that we need an honest assessment of where we are, has become um, so desperate um, that if, if we don't fight back and we don't rekindle the traditions of, 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 of the unions from years ago, the traditions of the shop stewards movement, the traditions of collective consciousness, um, raising the level, set an example uh, of, of taking militant action, industrial action, uh, uh, and collective action, um, I, I, I think we are going to be uh, in for a terrible life. Precisely um, the reasons that have been uh, outlined, you know, the furloughs coming to the end, there's problems uh, with sick pay, there's problems <coughs> with obtaining uh, protective equipment at work. Uh, we're, we're entering the second wave of uh, the pandemic. Um, and, you know, we've, we're facing um, uh, one of the biggest economic uh, disasters uh, there's ever been uh, in uh, uh, the, the history of capitalism, if you like, and things are only going to get worse. And I think 
um, what's 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 going to happen is that obviously there is going to be a movement back um, from the working class in every country in the world, um, including uh, uh, Britain, to fight back against uh, uh, the status quo. The problem is that um, we have got a bureaucracy, um, industrial and political, um, that are basically controlled um, by uh, the establishment <coughs> and throw cold water um, on every uh, dispute uh, that develops. Um, I think really the trade union uh, bureaucracy who live a different lifestyle uh, to, to the members that they're supposed to be uh, uh, representing because of the exorbitant uh, wages and um, you know the, the cushy uh, conditions uh, they're working uh, under um, actually pour cold water uh, and, and, and do deals um, to, to, to how could you put it stop the development of any strike action that could uh, really uh, put the establishment on the back foot <coughs> and the last time I can really remember um, mass action of this nature taking place <coughs> was back in 2011 and it involved uh, uh, the GMB union, um, uh, uh, Unison, they were two main unions involved, also the PCS and teachers unions and Unite. And although Unite was um, the biggest union involved at the time, um, it had the sort sort of uh, the smallest membership that were affected by it. It involved local government workers, health workers, civil servants, um, and uh, education workers, and it was over um, the the question of a tax on uh, uh, public service uh, pensions. And I can remember quite so uh, clearly at the time because I was working um, <coughs> for for uh, the GMB <coughs> uh, union. And um, we had a situation where um, on the day uh, of the strike, I'd, I'd uh, not seen anything uh, like it since um, the 80s and the miners' dispute and then the printers' dispute after that. But where, you know, for instance, we, we were putting placards and, and, and everything together for mass picketing uh, that was going to take place. We, we was up in Harringay. My mate I used to work closely with uh, was on the Houses of Parliament. And I can remember that day very well when we all went to the picket line and we were hearing reports coming uh, from across uh, the country. Uh, towns and cities uh, having uh, schools and hospitals and council offices <coughs> uh, picketed. And there was a massive uh, uh, turnout, as I say, um, I think that was the uh, biggest uh, amount of strike days uh, lost in uh, a, a year, uh, and as, as a result of that uh, strike that took place in uh, uh, on November the 30th, I think it was 2011, and all these reports were coming through of uh, the biggest demonstrations ever taking place because that was um, the plan of the day that we would uh, lobby. Uh, lobby. Um, we would have pickets outside the uh, workplaces uh, in the morning <coughs> and then we'd all go off to a demonstration in the afternoon. We had a big demonstration in London and we was hearing reports from every town and city in the country coming through. Biggest trade union demonstrations I've ever seen. And those of us on the left, perhaps a little bit naively, we thought to ourselves, this is it. Um, we're going to start um, getting back some of the things that we've uh, lost over the last uh, 30 uh, years since the defeat of the miners and the printers and what have you. But, and this is, the, is the, where the trade union bureaucracy uh, uh, comes in, they squared off the local government uh, workers. And what they did was they called um, the GMB and Unison, and Unite was involved, but Unite only had a very small minority of members affected uh, by it. So the big two unions were GMB and um, Unison. <coughs> they were called in to negotiations and they were offered a relatively um, good deal. 
they then decided to pull out from any other action. That broke the back of uh, the dispute. And in the end, I think it was the PCS <coughs> and the Civil Service Union that was left uh, totally isolated. <coughs> Everyone else um, got uh, turned over. And I think what you actually saw in that week in uh, November and the first week of December of 2011 was the best and worst of British trade unionism, the potential um, that uh, really existed to defeat the government that was sold out um, by a national uh, union uh, bureaucracy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, think, I personally think um, that that is what they are actually there for. Now, it's what I've experienced all my life. This was a national uh, dispute. But as Dave said in the introduction, um, even in local uh, disputes, um, you know, you'd reach a certain stage where you've pulled uh, the members out. Well, you don't pull the members out. The members are um, the union. You, 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 you called meetings, you've explained what's going on, you've explained what the management proposals are, you explain um, what that means, <coughs> and then collective decisions are taken uh, to withdraw uh, labour or um, to, to, to lobby the council or whatever um, it might be. And what I've always found in five out of the six unions I've been in, in all the decades I've been active in the unions, it reaches a certain point, then the full-timers are called in <coughs> and, you know, you, you're offered an extra tap and tape near an hour or whatever um, the deal uh, might be. And then the union, um, uh, the, 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 the full-time bureaucrats, uh, are arguing that you should accept this and we should put uh, this dispute uh, uh, to bed. Now, I'd just like to say a few things uh, about state of the unions uh, in this country because I think that situation um, has been developing over the last 40 years uh, since the defeats and they couldn't always get away with things like this. The members actually held them uh, to account. But where there's been a drop in uh, membership, where there has been decimation of the shop stewards' uh, committees, the members, if you like, are, are, are a patty in the hands of the um, uh, bureaucrats uh, when it comes to situations like this. Because, <coughs> quite frankly, um, the union full-time bureaucrats um, uh, actually practice what I call uh, corporate uh, trade unionism, where they sell the union, and, and that's the sort of language that they use, sell the union, uh, as if it's um, some sort of <coughs> industrial insurance society, where, you know, for the sake of a few quid a week um, in your subscriptions, we've got experts in the world of work uh, waiting to give you advice guidance and even representation if you uh, have an employment uh, problem. These characters, these bureaucrats, they see themselves uh, and the apparatus of uh, the union as the union and not the members. And it doesn't matter how many times the leaders of Unite and Unison say membership lead, um, it, their, their unions are absolutely nothing of the sort. They are ruled um, by a bureaucracy who practice corporate trade unionism, sell um, the union on the basis of it being an industrial insurance society. And um, basically their priority is to get recognition agreements with employers that gives them access to new employees um, so as they can recruit and justify uh, their existence. Now, I think that. Um, it's, it's necessary to be scrupulously honest and, and look at uh, this situation so as we don't get um, knocked sideways um, like many of us uh, were when we, we were first confronted uh, with this situation and recognise the fact it isn't just the employers you're fighting, it's going to be um, the bureaucracy uh, nine times out of ten. And in my own union, um, at the moment, I'll tell you how 
bad it is. Um, in, in, could, you, in, could you sum up now, uh, Steve, in the next couple of minutes? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, perhaps I won't, won't tell you how bad it is because uh, it's depressing, but I'll tell you about Unison, your old union, where you've got um, a general secretary uh, election going on at the moment and a chap called Paul Holmes, who is the left-wing rank-and-file uh, uh, candidate. And uh, he's received a record number of nominations uh, from branches and service committees and what, on, what have you. And he's exactly the sort of chap um, that should represent uh, the left and the rank and file. He's um, not prepared to accept the £130,000 wages that goes with the general secretary job if he um, actually overcomes the odds and wins uh, uh, the election. He's prepared to um, sort of only accept the wages that he's on uh, at the moment. But above all, his argumentation is that money... Uh, and resources, finance and resources should be devolved from a national and regional level and from the bureaucracy in the union down to a branch level so as the branch uh, can actually control how the union is organised in the local workplaces and that the members uh, can get a reliable service and get more involved uh, in the union. I don't think um, we should uh, uh, go into this with any illusions um, about what the unions are. We know what they're meant to be, but that is the state of play in most unions today. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Um, quite understandably, you dwelled on a lot of the negative aspects of trade unionism. I mentioned that in my lead off. But I think in terms of this discussion, I think we can pretty well accept that across the world, men, much of the union movement is going down, has gone down the same path. And I really think we ought to, if you like, if we're going to make a contribution, uh, you can say that that's the situation, but we need to be talking about what is the way forward for the trade union movement and the working class now. And it's in this way that we can then get into a real discussion about the potential for building something different than what we've had for the past uh, 40 years, let's say. So I, I do appreciate the comments that you've made. And the next speaker is Jade. Uh, and I think you're, if you can introduce the, your union as well, because I'm not really familiar, Jade, with your union. Yeah, sure. Um... Hi everyone and, and thanks for having me uh, again on this call. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add a, a kind of note because you mentioned Jade McAvee's uh, book, which is which is brilliant. I mean, uh, we also do a lot of uh, training with her as well, but I also wanted to point to uh, an author called Kim Moody, who although focuses uh, more on the US, kind of writes a lot about the changes in industry and, and how the trade union fight or the worker, working class fight needs to change alongside it. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time kind of talking about the underlying economic conditions of precarity. I mean, we all acknowledge that, that they're there and they're making organizing more difficult, not just in the decline of, of, trade, uh, of trade union membership, but, uh, but also in, in being able to reach out to workers, you know, uh, a long-standing uh, strength of uh, uh, of the trade union movement has been, you know, you can go into a workplace and find 2,000, 3,000 people standing shoulder to shoulder and, you know, under the same conditions. Uh, now this has been, uh, you know, changed drastically and uh, especially when we're talking about precarious work, there's there's a big question of where do you even find these workers to try and organize them, especially now under COVID conditions. Everyone is sitting at home. You, you no longer have this kind of social precondition that was previously there uh, to, to help you or empower you in, in your organizing. So uh, just some of the challenges I thought I'd, I'd skip over. Um, but yeah, I, I will introduce kind of the IWW, which stands for the Industrial Workers of the World. 
um, just to correct uh, Roger, uh, I, I get mixed up as well. Sometimes say international workers of the world. Now we're, we're double worldly, <laughs> internationally and worldly. Um, but yeah, we, we are a smaller union uh, in the UK, especially. So I'm, I'm based in Dumfries in Scotland and I'm the general organizer for education workers in the union. Um, but the union overall uh, sports about 4,000 members. We have 18 branches across the UK and Ireland. Um, and because of our size uh, and the way we organize, we have been uh, focusing more on workers in the gig economy and uh, or, you know, more precarious workers. Um, just looking at my notes here. Right. Uh, we're also, there also has been a lot of talk. Uh, that's nice to see some fellow workers in, in the comments. Uh, it's good to have you here. Um, uh, great. <laughs> uh, right. Sorry. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of talk about bureaucracy and, and our focus is, you know, exclusively to not be a bureaucratic organization. Uh, essentially, we focus on the rank and file. We are the rank and file. We don't have any kind of paid organizers, any kind of bureaucracy to deal with. At the end of the day, it is the workers in the workplace making the decision. And our role, if we are not in that workplace, is to provide support, provide information, do some kind of research around that. Um, so that, that's pretty much who we are. Um, I wanted to focus on three cases from around the world where the IWW has been involved in, especially around precarious organizing. The first is that of food couriers in Toronto. The second is freelance journalists union in New York. And then the third is here in the UK, um, organizing that's been happening in English language teaching schools. Um, so, you know, going back to this idea of where are the workers, one of the hardest campaigns that I've been involved in is that of food couriers in Toronto. So we all know of all these apps where you can kind of go on and uh, order your food and someone on a bike will show up and kind of deliver it for you. Well, people who, who work in that industry, you know, there's, no, there's not even an office there. You know, they, they turn on an app and they get orders and then they fulfill these orders. So, um, and they deal with some of the most dangerous conditions, you know, cycling on the roads, uh, potentially being hit by, by cars or, or not having safe infrastructure. And you have no kind of work safety. You know, you, you, you act as a independent contractor or someone who's self-employed. Um, so you get no kind of vacation pay, you get no, uh, you know, no kind of basic, um, workers safety that's covered the only thing you get paid for is per delivery you do so we've been seeing this rolling back into this uh, piecework type compensation scheme um so you know tell you a bit about how we were able to to organize with those workers um, first of course we were approached by the workers themselves we couldn't we didn't kind of just go and say hey you need to be organized. You have these problems that uh, that you're facing. Uh, we were approached by the workers and started understanding how to build infrastructures to reach those workers. Uh, we found out in Toronto there were three bike shops that most of the couriers would use either to repair their bike or also to attend social activities for other bikers in the city. Uh, and then we kind of partnered with those small businesses to help spread the word and to start building an alternative communication, um, which was essentially just a, a WhatsApp uh, messaging group. And then we also had a private Facebook group to start being able to reach to all of these couriers. Um, eventually, uh, and this might be a, uh, eventually we were able to identify where this fight for unionizing the workplace was going to be on, and it was going to be on uh, misclassifying the workers in terms of what kind of contract they're on. Um, so based on that, they chose to uh, take a legalistic approach and then, um, you know, uh, argue uh, at the labor board that, you know, there is a misclassification of the workers, which they won, and then they were able to unionize. However, a few months after that immense victory, 
um, the company that they were unionizing against announced that they are shutting their offices across Canada entirely. Um, you know, and this can't be seen except as a scare tactic to, you know, teach, you know, teach the workers a lesson. If you've dared to speak out and to unionize against us, uh, then this is what's going to happen. There's an economic price to pay. Um, however, the fight did not end there. The union actually sued them for shutting down um, suddenly and was able to uh, to get a sort of a financial reward actually by suing them. So. Uh, they were able to pretty much flip that scenario around where the company was trying to punish the workers, but they were able to get some sort of justice uh, from that. Um, the other example I wanted to give is that of the Freelance Journalists Union, which is based in New York. Um, so in the IWW, we organize industrially. So the Freelance Journalists Union, like the um, uh, English Teachers Union in the UK, is part of the, a, a larger um, a larger body. So uh, in the UK, it would be the education workers. Um, it slips my mind now what the freelance journalist union uh, falls under in the US. Uh, but having said that, they uh, the way they organize, they organize successfully as well against an organization there by uh, doing, starting with something as basic as sending out a survey for their freelance journalists. They identified one organization that was known for skipping out or uh, skipping out paying invoices or paying them very, very late. Um, after they identified that single company, they then did a lot of research, went and saw who has actually written for that company, contacted them, uh, were able to put together a legal case to uh, for the company to pay uh, all overdue fees and were able to wrestle 150,000 US dollars uh, from that company uh, within a week to, to pay all outstanding invoices that, that they had. Uh, so another kind of example of how uh, through the union was able to lead the campaign by, uh, by doing basics, you know, surveys, research and, and sticking to those things. Um, the final campaign I want to talk about was the Eng English language teachers in the UK. Um, so as we've mentioned now with coronavirus, there has been a massive spike of, uh, uh, spike of redundancies. And because the working conditions in these English language teaching schools are, are pretty dire, uh, you know, they go from contract to contract. There's no sort of full-time continuity of employment as redundancy uh, as now redundancy packages are being extended to workers, they're not reflecting the full, year, full years of employment because they're able to say, well, you've been on a contract, we're only counting X many years of your contract instead of your proper full, uh, full time of service. So what we've been doing there is trying to collectivize, uh, the term we like to use is collectivize the fight. Uh, when these issues have come to us as individual kind of representative cases, uh, you know, we've we've suddenly we've put out a media campaign to reach out to other employees who are employed by the same. And um, oh, sorry, I'm just reading the comments. Yes, the delivery workers uh, killed in Dublin. I, I I heard about that. It is, it's very unfortunate. Um, that just goes to show you the conditions they they kind of work under. Um, yeah, so going back to, to the UK, we've had to um, try to collectivize the struggle and then take on the organization as a whole instead of these individual uh, cases one by one. So these are just some of the, uh, some of the examples that we can show on, on how to successfully fight under these kind of strict and tricky uh, conditions. Some of the uh, lessons that we can draw out is, you know, collectivizing issues, uh, as soon as they get to us, otherwise they might just be limited to what we call service unionism, which is, you know, uh, as uh, as the previous speaker touched on, this idea of uh, the union being an insurance policy where you just pay a membership fee and uh, and when you run into a problem, you come and run to your rep and ask them for help. So as soon as we get any kind of request for help, we automatically go to the rest of our membership and see, okay, who else is dealing with this? How can we collectivize the issue and make this into some kind of mass action? 
Um, the second is using unorthodox measures uh, instead of legalistic approaches. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the major and larger unions are forced to go into a, a legal, you know, balloting process, a more bureaucratic approach. But our flexibility and our focus on the workplace itself allows us to use much simpler kind of tools and coming from the workers themselves because they ultimately know what might and might not work in their workplace. And it might be something as simple as, uh, as suddenly showing up to work uh, wearing a, a, you know, a union button uh, without before coming out uh, you know, as a union, uh, writing a, a letter. We do uh, march on the bosses as well as something we use. Uh, so, so we have a lot of you know, tools and, and kind of tactics that we use before having to come to this large bureaucratic type, uh, you know, let's vote and, and, and let's go for strike action. So it is by engaging with the issues directly as soon as they show up, instead of waiting for them to, to grow, that we're able to, to kind of keep the bosses in check, essentially. Um, Another one is going to the workers and building a campaign from scratch, as we've seen with the freelance journalists union, um, just understanding the lay of the land and, and knowing, you know, where, who are the problematic ones and scoring those small wins. I mean, 150,000 US dollars is probably a big deal for the freelance journalists and is a great example to show for workers, uh, but it is a, a, a a small victory that you can then build on and build pre uh, you know, the, the next campaign on. Uh, and then the, fine th uh, the final thing, just because uh, uh, Jane McAvee also kind of touches on this, uh, you know, because precarious work negatively impacts mostly minority communities and women, uh, we need to start thinking of organizing beyond just the workplace. And because of the infrastructure of the workplace is no longer what it was, no longer where you can go in, you have 2000 workers doing the same thing. We have to find other ways to reach them and build infrastructures outside of the workplace to be able to build, uh, to organize effectively and, uh, and attract uh, members to, to the unions and engage them in that way. So those are kind of the general lessons and uh, in some cases of, of how we've been able to, uh, to properly organize within the broader precarious environment. Thanks very much, Jay. That was very interesting and I certainly learned a lot. But just for clarification, is your organization IWW the same as IWGB? No, it's not. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. All right. So, um, yeah, that was... And how long have you been going? That was the other question I was going to ask you. IWW in this country. So, so the IWW traces itself back till 1905. Oh, uh, it I was, was aware it of was the, based yeah. in yeah, it was based in in the U.S. It yeah. came out of Chicago, but uh, uh, within the interwar periods, it was severely suppressed because we are an an explicitly anti-capitalist union. Uh, so, so you know, we've gone through um, kind of cycles of illegality and legality. Uh, and now we're we're kind of witnessing a bit of a, of a growth and a resurgence, both in the UK and in the States. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, next up is Jabu from Oxford, who also has been a previous speaker at the Workers International uh, Network meetings. And Jabu's involved in trade union activity, uh, mainly through the living wage campaign. So Jabu, um, Let's hear you. Looking forward to hearing your contribution. Okay, good evening all. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Jabu Nala Hartley. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm chair of the Oxford Living Wage campaign, which is uh, basically it's a campaign that's made up of activists and trade unionists. And uh, it hopes, well, it, it, it's brought also brought together students, faith groups, and uh, many other, other campaigners across the city. And it encourages uh, employers to pay the Oxford living wage. And uh, it also helps underpaid workers organize in support of it. 
So um, we regularly hold uh, drop-in workshops every Saturdays. Uh, we have Zooms now since the COVID-19, but um, besides that, uh, I wanted to discuss how the Oxford Living Wage came about and why we felt there was a need to actually uh, have this um, campaign. Uh, as you know, um, Oxford is a very, very expensive place uh, to live in. Um, I'm just going to quickly go into my history a bit that uh, I, as, as, as Dave was talking about the minor strike, I originally came to Oxford from South Africa in 1984 during uh, the miners' strike and um, I was raised by a trade unionist. My mother was a uh, part of Mau, which is now, uh, sorry, she was part of Mau, which is now Numsa. So the aims of uh, the, 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 the Oxford Living Wage was to promote the living wage amongst uh, employers and, and employees in Oxford. So what we've been doing is um, workers, they come into the space and they, uh, which we've provided and they come with various grievances that they're faced with pertaining their pay and conditions at work. And uh, we talk to them about how they can challenge and, uh, and try and unionize, especially in the gig economy, which is quite challenging as the two speakers have uh, quickly outlined. But the biggest challenge that we've been coming across in Oxford, as, as many cities will, is, uh, is, is, is basically uh, coming from the migrant workers who work around the universities and, uh, and, and hospitals uh, as precarious workers. Uh, is, in order to actually um, sort of set up the living wage as, a, as, a, as, a, as an effective force. We started by identifying a lot of um, employers and we had some kind of like, we, have, we had a big list of employers in Oxford, those who paid and those who didn't pay living wage. So what we are doing. Sorry, there's a noise. Hello? Can you hear that? Oh, okay. So we had we, we drew up a, a list of employers who paid and who, who who don't paid, and then we started approaching the employers that do pay it. Uh, and through the city council, because we work with the Oxford City Council, we started uh, having award ceremonies to actually encourage other employers. It was quite interesting when we went for these awards to hear people that were in management positions talking about the expen how expensive Oxford was and how they were welcoming our work as uh, basically as campaigners. But it was always difficult because uh, the Oxford University being one of the largest employers in Oxford wasn't prepared to pay the living wage. So there's been quite a lot of work that's been done and they only agreed this year in February uh, to actually pay the Oxford living wage but it's still a, a, a bit of a, 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 sore, a, sore, a sore spot because whilst they pay the Oxford living wage, what they've done to the workers that uh, work in precarious contracts is uh, workers used to get paid a uh, time and a half at weekends. They have kept that. So now that uh, they could claw back the money that they are now paying workers. So it's a, it's a, it's a catch and mouse, it's a cat and mouse game in terms of uh, the wages. But another space that we provide because we work together with trade unions, uh, trade unions, they, they do um, give us little donations, not that much, as just a, you know, a few pounds there and there. But uh, because we are uh, always sort of forming campaigns around the city, we've, we've um, organized various campaigns in terms of having buses, uh, um, what you call display our logo. We were, before we went into COVID, we were due to um, have a huge bus campaign, which was going to take a whole week. And we would have uh, a lot of organizations which do affiliate to the Oxford Living Wage 
uh, uh, posted around the buses. So the, the, the other thing that we did last year to actually highlight the plight of the living conditions in Oxford and the, and the, and the, and the, low, pay, the way, low, low wages, we had a huge uh, gig economy uh, event, which we called to gig or not to gig, where we invited uh, Francis O'Grady and uh, uh, the, the, the now shadow chancellor, uh, Annalise Dodds, and various unions from the GMB, Unite, Unison, Nassau, uh, even from the Trades Council, and we had a really successful big campaign around uh, 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 the gig economy. And culminating from that, as part of our, our political activities, we're part of, I'm part of the Labour Party in Oxford. So we are forever writing motions. We've just uh, had our general AMM uh, this week and a lot of our motions around the gig economy and precarious worker. We, we tend to, we've been moving them at sort of like 98% support for the, for the actions that we're taking uh, to support workers in the gig economy. So um, besides, uh, also another very critical issue is that trade unions are finding it hard to maneuver with all the le legal red tape that has been binding them. So they are not uh, 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 as free as they used to be in terms of, uh, you know, mobilizing uh, uh, around uh, the, 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 the gig economy. So the ma maneuverability is especially hard, especially when it comes to uh, calling for, 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 for industrial action. So we regularly hold these uh, Saturday mornings and we, we get different people from different unions coming in. And the, the one that comes into mind is the CW, CWU, which is the Communication Workers Union. Uh, basically, they come and talk about the struggles that they face especially when it comes to uh, being fined or sort of, of or, or any way you know about the, 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 the legal ramifications of uh, taking uh, so-called unlawful strikes. So the, the, it's, it's a really difficult time for uh, unions to organize. But besides the, 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 the difficulties, as uh, uh, two speakers have touched on the bureaucratic nature of what a uh, unions find themselves where you find the, 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 the bureaucracy within the unions uh, stifles the, the type of action that people want to take because people are too busy trying to protect their big salaries. The Oxford Living Wage Campaign is a purely voluntary uh, organization. We don't get paid. What I do is just pure activism. There's no, there's no uh, uh, payment towards this. So what's happening then is that we find we do send people to different unions that they, uh, they, 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 they can join. We encourage them to join unions. But there's a big uh, disillusion uh, from uh, workers in terms of the representation. We've had workers that have joined as precarious workers and found that whilst they were paying, they couldn't be represented by the unions because of the time frame that uh, they started paying their subs and uh, that went that that went down the hill i had we had one particular worker who had a problem with uh, oxford university with regards to a a, a racist matter and uh, one of the unions that uh, i'm not going to mention this union but one of the organizers basically sold them out and 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 and, and, and didn't even represent the person even though they had paid their subs so there's, a, there's, there's so many issues that are, are, are putting people off uh, the, 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 the joining trade unions, especially when uh, they, they don't have a big collective in their, in their workplaces. But we do have a sort of promising uh, groups for migrant uh, workers, like such as some um, cleaners from, uh, I think it's Tira Maris. Uh, they are busy trying to organize themselves around new unions such as ACON, which also uh, comes in to, 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 to speak to us. So as part of the Oxford Living Wage, part of the mobilization strategies has been around also to 
create a unified uh, front in Oxford for different issues that affect people, not just from uh, wages, but just basically dealing, uh, dealing with poverty is an all-round issue, especially around housing, around health, around education. So we, 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 we recently, I mean, I told some of my few comrades here, we recently, it was the 22nd of August this year, we managed to put together a unity march which culminated of over 30 organizations in Oxford who came in to join from all sort of different uh, plights of uh, sort of uh, like uh, from climate, uh, climate justice, uh, extension rebellions, organization like that, uh, tenancy unions, ACON, we had a, a Socialist Health Association, Socialist Education Association, all sorts. And, and, and it was a really successful march that uh, marched through the city and, uh, and, and, and affiliating itself to the Living Wage Campaign. There's also another side of the Living Wage Campaign, which we work very closely with Oxford City Council. So right now we have a a, a, a living wage campaign champion who is normally a councillor. We've just lost one now because he's now moved to to London. But uh, the leader of the Labour Party, Susan Brown, has now taken the role, which is going to be quite interesting because uh, she is not a socialist. And so it's going to be interesting how we work with her in terms of her, her, her strength. She's not particularly left wing in, 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 her, in her politics, but uh, she has been part of the negotiating process around uh, getting the university to pay the living wage, but also uh, subsequently negotiated with BMW who were threatening a lot of redundancies around the city, which uh, they've now uh, done a U-turn, which was great, is great achievement for the living wage because a lot of people were facing an ex, but it's not when it's not over. They still they're still in that sort of uh, there's still that threat. There's still that threat. It's not, but it's at least it's been uh, delayed and, and 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 people are feeling a, a little bit, you know, uh, you know, comfortable, but not not as comfortable as if you had a permanent jobs. So so the other part uh, is also um, we have been working closely with. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, Black Lives Matter has been relevant in a sense that it, uh, it, it, it really kind of makes us focus on the issues regarding um, uh, Black workers and Black wages because uh, we, they are the most exploited, especially in, uh, in, in, in precarious employment. So we've worked together to try and recognize these issues and uh, We've uh, been able to um, get people to um, to come in and tell uh, different, um, you know, di different stories about what they go through in in, in, in their workplaces. One of the uh, new trends that uh, we seem, seems to seem to be coming across is that. Um, there's been a deliberate. Uh, 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 there's been a deliberate uh, action from the employers to 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 make uh, the older people who've been there with con long term contracts redundant, and then uh, give them uh, uh, not so much. Not I mean the payouts aren't that great. Give them payouts and then they re-employ people under those uh, contracts, but then change the conditions. Uh, of the, what the contracts used to be, people are finding themselves uh, doing more jobs than they would where, where a person like one, one of the uh, ones we identified was people working in hotels, like travel lodge where people are, are being paid, are not being paid the living wage, being paid like eight pounds something an hour and they've got to do cleaning, they've got to do uh, domestic uh, room cleaning, they've got to do power work. So they've piled up the work on top of very low wages. So there's quite a lot of challenges. But uh, as I said, we work, we're working uh, very hard to, to kind of, uh, you know, highlight these plights. We are working together with, um, we, 
students who are, you know, the, the problem is students, they are, they, are, they are not static in terms of, they are not fixed. They are, they are static because they don't stick around for too long. Once they finish their degrees, uh, you know, we have to start afresh and work with new students. But one of the students, um, uh, officers has, has recently put a, 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 an SU general meeting to get SU to commit to paying their own staff uh, the Oxford living wage, which uh, is really good for Oxford Brooks University because that's another, the, the, that's another uh, employer which has been really difficult to actually get to commit to, to, to the Oxford living wage. So another thing that I wanted to um, touch on was uh, the initiatives um, around the, 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 the coalition uh, which we've got was that, um, uh, you know, we've, we are now meeting regularly and having uh, debates across, uh, you know, these uh, organizations uh, which wouldn't have met before. And uh, what's been really, really interesting is that um, uh, we, we, we've we got, even today we had somebody from, uh, uh, you know, um, Amnesty International, who's the president of Amnesty Inter Inter International at the Oxford University, join and, and basically she, they've, they've initiated another one where we can meet up and just uh, and, and, and talk more about uh, what we can do in Oxford. So this unity trend is really, uh, is really catching in terms of uh, the work that's that's been done in Oxford, and one of another thing that I wanted to 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 to, to kind of bring up was when we were marching uh, during the, the the big unity march. It was quite interesting to hear like the old slogans like "Together, United, will never be defeated." But the the one that was really resonant with me was "Don't just clap, pay our wages." So the, the, the real, the, the COVID-19 um, plight of workers, especially that are working around the care, have really touched uh, people, uh, people's sense of, uh, you know, justice, because uh, it, it, it's, it's very clear that whilst they are working very hard, this government has not been, uh, you know, uh, forthcoming with uh, you, you know increasing their wages, I noticed even today uh, that a lot of people are being given uh, knighthoods uh, as part of uh, their dedication to to COVID and all these uh, OBEs or B BM whatever titles they are. But uh, there's no uh, sense of um, there's no there's no talk about uh, the increment uh, in their wages and part of the Oxford Living Wage as well, what we have done to actually try and, and be kind of innovative with what we do, we've been inviting other living wage campaigns like the Heathrow Living Wage campaign to come and tell us how they won their living wage campaign. It was quite interesting hearing the types of, um, uh, you know, uh, organizing tactics that people would, would talk about uh, as far as uh, the employees uh, uh, empowering themselves, one of one of one that was quite funny was for me was um, a man that was dusting a man that was dusting uh, his boss's um, his boss's uh, what you call his boss's picture, and he said, "Oh, this is your family. Uh, oh, how, I mean, how how, how they look beautiful." Do you go? Do you go on holiday often? And the boss is just basing the communication. Said, well, "Yes, yes, whatever." But and then the, the man said, "Well, it would be lovely for for me for my family to be able to travel." So I'm gonna end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jafu. Um, you interestingly, you mentioned uh, the TUC in in the guise of the secretary. Um, who came along to support. And you mentioned the role of unions. And I think we need to pick up on in the discussion the roles of those organisations in such a campaign, because one could say that generally the TUC doesn't get a lot of good press, but in that context of the living wage campaign, where you're mobilising 
across a wider strata of organisations in Oxford that maybe the TUC can play a useful role, but that can be picked up in the discussion. Thanks very much. So the next two speakers are going to be from Belarus and the independent trade union that Roger mentioned at the beginning. And I'm going to call first Lisa Vita, and uh, then it will be followed by Yuri, who, who will need some help with translation. So Lisa Vita, if you would like to come in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Hey everyone, I'm Lizaveta Mirliak from Grodno, from Belarus. Greetings. <laughs> um, that's a very nice discussion that you have today, tonight. Uh, um, as Dave, uh, Dave already mentioned, the issue of social dialogue. Um, uh, I should say that social dialogue also kind of exists in Belarus. At least there is a visibility of this social dialogue and tripartism. Uh, however, in this country, this triangle looks like the state. Uh, the state employer and the state union, they have the dialogue and the independent unions are somewhere somewhere away from this social dialogue. So the unionization rate in Belarus uh, is uh, about 96%, uh, while the whole unionization rate uh, in, the, uh, in the world is dropping dramatically uh, year by year. Here in Belarus we have 96% uh, workers unionized. Uh, that is a very strange phenomenon, actually. Uh, however, it can be, how to say, I can explain it easier, uh, just saying that uh, uh, there are two, um, two kinds of uh, uh, unions in the country. Uh, the biggest union, called the Federation of Trade Unions of Belarus, uh, that claims to have uh, over 4 million uh, employer, employees in their ranks, um, it is run by the state. So we can, we can call this uh, federation as a federation of yellow unions. And the smaller part of the, <laughs> of the union field uh, is um, the independent or democratic trade unions that are, are organized in uh, the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions. And my union and Yuri's as well is called Belarusian Independent Trade Union of Miners, Chemical Workers, Oil Refiners, um, construction, transport, and other workers. Like we have really a lot of uh, a lot of professions in our uh, name. Uh, so uh, we follow the tra tradition of independent uh, union movement that uh, that is traced back uh, to uh, 1894 in this country in Belarus when we had uh, first uh, uh, May Day meetings. Actually, in Grodno, it was 1894. Uh, and uh, the yellow unions uh, start their history with the creation of uh, uh, Soviet Union. And by then, um, first they were uh, workers' organizations actually, but later the Communist Party, which is an authoritarian left party, uh, uh, made them part of the mechanism of suppression of workers actually. So um, the independent trade union movement uh, started again uh, 29 years ago with the collapse of the Soviet Union actually. And uh, we, we are always on the side of the workers compared to the state unions. Like the state unions are always on the side of the employer. And even if, even if this regime, this uh, um, authoritarian regime of Lukashenko falls, they would continue to be on the side of the employer. Like uh, at the moment, uh, the, the biggest employer in the country is the state. So we call this regime uh, a state capitalist regime. Like the capital belongs to the state, uh, most of it. Uh, even if this regime changes, um, those yellow unions are going to be uh, left on the side of the employer. Whoever comes to be an employer, if it is a, a free market capitalist, then they would be on the side of this free market capitalism. And um, uh, we claim to be on the part of the, on the side of the workers, uh, no matter who comes to power. Uh, I'm very glad that um, Jade mentioned this word, collectivize. I really love it, collectivize the struggle. When we explain our members, uh, what, when we explain our newcomers, new members, what independent trade union is, we say that it is a collective action. It's not the, 
the chairperson of the union or it's not a bureau of the union elected uh, elected representatives of the union it is the collective action of all the union members it's really hard to um, uh, to uh, boost the activities of uh, of the independent union um, because there was a this lack of activities, lack of collective action uh, for 20, for over 26 years uh, of this uh, Lukashenko regime, uh, when all the workers were uh, suppressed, uh, suppressed by, by the regime and not, not many collective actions were taken. However, our union, the Independent Union of Miners and Chemical Workers, um, can say that uh, we tried our best to um, preserve uh, the spirit and preserve the, you know, the the idea of uh, um, grassroots um, um, grassroots uh, movement. Um, uh, at the moment, you know that uh, in this country, in Belarus, um, we have really hard times uh, uh, with um, uh, with the state trying to uh, uh, trying to. Uh, keep its uh, position. I mean, we didn't vote for for ex-president Lukashenko. We voted for another person, um, and uh, the elections were um, uh, were not fair. They were neither fair nor transparent, and uh, we see that one person, uh, supported by an army of military and uh, police, is trying to keep in power. And um, uh, as a collective action to workers, uh, at the moment uh, we propose to have this easy, uh, small, easy step that can be done collectively. We ask them, the workers, to leave the state unions because the state unions are the biggest support of um, of, of Lukashenko and his regime. Uh, the uh, the state union federation was actually nominating him to be a president uh, for these elections, for the elections of 2020. Um, so, um, what we see at the moment is that at many enterprises, which are state-owned, many workers leave the state unions and they uh, join the independent unions, which is also very good. Um, uh, if we mention uh, mm, union models like the, it was mentioned uh, above uh, like uh, there are service models um, and um, organizing models of, of the union uh, uh, we try to be uh, uh, to be the organizing model and uh, uh, it's kind of it's 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 a harder a harder way to uh, to work <laughs> it's not just sitting on the uh, membership fees and uh, providing juridical support or uh, I don't know <laughs> uh, giving presents for for holidays or whatever or like um, the state yellow unions do uh, they distribute uh, uh, social benefits provided by the uh, by the employer um, at the moment we are thinking of uh, what new organizing methods uh, can be used in our situation. So the first step, as I said, as I said, was uh, to ask uh, uh, workers uh, to leave the state unions. The next step would be to do to do collective actions together uh, to uh, not only be um, present uh, at the working place, but also to to be part of a wider movement. Actually, wider movement of citizens who. Uh, oppose the state and uh, who want to protect their votes and uh, who want to have uh, a different future. Uh, that is hard to do. Just imagine 26 years without any collective actions and I see that uh, many workers are very hesitant. They leave the state unions but they don't join the independent unions and here we have to organize more. That is the only recipe I think. Um, um, one more thing that I want to mention is that um, there are already proposals from the uh, from some uh, uh, 
uh, European Union countries like Poland, Lithuania, Hungary, I think, uh, their governments said that uh, uh, they would they would uh, support uh, support Belarusians and Belarus, free Belarus without Lukashenko, and uh, uh, they would provide some uh, economic help, kind of. And here, uh, uh, in the independent trade union movement, we understand that um, uh, they are talking about um, uh, about uh, uh, the IMF, about the World Bank. Um, packages of help kind of to the post-communist countries um, and um, uh, like uh, like those reforms the packages of reforms that they already uh, tried on Poland on Lithuania and maybe that is why those countries try to um, um, put forward the same the same thing for Belarus but um, uh, we Belarusians and independent unions believe that we are um, we are worth more. I mean, we are worth more decent reforms than this. And at the moment, we are discussing um, the ways to um, uh, to have. Um, um, let me find words. Um, uh, we want to have our own labor policies implemented after Lukashenko leaves. Uh, we don't want these packages of. Uh, um, uh, I forgot the word in English. Uh, austerity reforms. We don't want austerity reforms. We 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 want to have social spending, uh, spending on uh, pub public spending, and uh, for that we are uh, seeking the um, partnership uh, with. Uh, um, research communities for example research communities from universities which are not so neoliberal like london school of economics for example or chicago school of economics or warsaw school of economics those that uh, that are mentioned by by the uh, eu um, um, uh, eu leadership uh, uh, to be our kind of package of help and assistance um, and I hope that uh, as soon as we start uh, uh, start uh, group work um, with representatives of uh, of uh, Keynesian for example uh, uh, economic e economists and uh, professors of uh, global labor university um, because we already have this kind of idea who to invite to uh, to have this um, platform with us, a uh, platform of uh, pro-workers reforms that are possible for Belarus. So I think that um, as soon as we have this group organized, uh, we will start uh, uh, working on this issue. Um, um, what else? Um, maybe Yuri will, will add? to to the situation thing okay because i'm right. done with the with the unions <laughs> that's Hello. that's fine lisa vita thank you very much yeah, that welcome. was very interesting uh, to hear what the independent trade union perspective is uh, and how that contrasts with the state union so i think we've learned a lot from that mm -hmm. so um yuri if you could Speak. Yeah. I take it that Elena is going to be supporting you in terms of translation. So, how's this going to work, Elena? Uh, Elena is here. Ah, you can speak. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, go ahead. And if uh, Elena needs to come in or you need help, just ask her. Um, so go ahead, Yuri. Probably I'll I will need a help, but I try to explain uh, some things about pressure on the workers. Uh, there are uh, ideologists uh, working in the plant uh, and they are everywhere uh, at the state's plants. Uh, and we now facing such a problem. Uh, these ideologists talk to our workers about uh, their membership and in independent trade union and uh, softly 
uh, press on, on, on our workers and tell them not to be in trade union independent. Um, but as I know, uh, such cases are everywhere. And people uh, are afraid of the pressure, afraid to, um, to lose their job, and they don't, in our organization, uh, just because of this reason. A uh, huge part of, um, of workers on my plant, where I worked for seven years, Grodna Azot, uh, it's um, such a great uh, fertilizer uh, for our country and uh, they um, sell much, much, many, many tons of uh, ammonia and urea uh, on export. Uh, um, hot, hot. Lisa, can you help me? One of us will help, for sure. Oh, Yelena. О чем я хотел сказать? О том, что люди, которые у нас работают, наши работники, и работники всех других госпредприятий, сталкиваются с одним и тем же. С ними начинают разговаривать поодиночке, искать причины, по которым, на, на которых можно воздействовать. Например, у лидера э, страйкового комитета э, МТЗ Сергея Делевского был очень интересный разговор, насколько я понимаю, это было сегодня. Э, он ушел в итоге с работы э, под давлением чтобы его родители смогли остаться работать. Идеолог пообещал, что не будет никаких проблем с родителями. Но это есть аудиозапись этого разговора, она опубликована. So basically what happens, uh, the state ideologists, they take the workers aside one by one and try to find the pressure points, some points of influence, um, asking them, why are you trying to do this? Why are you trying to go and strike or join independent trade union? And one flagrant example is that Sergei Delevsky, who in fact was invited to speak um, when uh, he couldn't because he was arrested, um, he uh, was made to resign today. He, he spent his time in prison, he came out and um, he worked at the Minsk tractor plant, but the ideologists had a conversation with him and the deal uh, that was struck under pressure was that Sergei was forced to resign in exchange for his parents apparently allowing, uh, being allowed to stay and carry on working at the tractor plant. And there is the audio recording of the conversation. Uh, it all happened today. И вот в свете этих событий я хотел бы попросить тех, кто хочет нас поддержать, сказать, что мы знаем о таких случаях, о том, что вы нарушаете права людей на их свободное волеизъявление, вступление или не вступление в тот или иной профсоюз. И я думаю, что это могло бы помочь росту независимых профсоюзов, когда начнется такое на них оказывается давление со стороны именно вас, если вы хотите нам вот каким-то образом помочь, потому что э, это, эти мейлы они по-любому видят и читают, и это был бы такой очень хороший и вполне себе приемлемый шаг, в отличие от тех, которые делают они, э, и люди помимо этого получают анимные угрозы через мессенджеры, э, которые проявляют э, больше активности. Я думаю, что в сравнении с их методами такой метод тоже был бы действенным, но был бы чистым и не таким грязным, как поступают они. And um, um, in this regard, Yuri would like to ask those who would like to help the independent trade unions in Belarus to put some transparent and open pressure on the organizations. Um, 
for example, writing them a letter saying, well, we know what you're trying to do. We know you're trying to influence the workers' uh, rights, uh, their right to f expression of free will, to join independent uh, trade union of their choice. And that would help the growth of independent trade unions. And that would counter the method that some of those um, ideologists and authorities um, use um, along the lines of anonymous threats um, sent to people's messengers uh, in their phones, uh, trying to threaten them. And this open letter, because hopefully the official trade unions and uh, the Belarus authorities do read their mail, um, do read the letters that come in, and they will see that it's... it's uh, uh, known to the world what they're trying to do and uh, that other organizations and trade unions are not using such underhand methods as they do. И еще вот хотел бы что добавить. Просто сейчас для того, чтобы члены профсоюза были защищены, мне приходится договариваться с адвокатами, которые готовы поддерживать именно профсоюзы, чтобы те могли заключить какой-то договор с членами профсоюза, выборочный или как. Мы еще обсудим это на начале следующей недели. Но суть в том, что мы э, парализованы тем, что мы должны искать юристов просто для людей, потому что помимо, э, помимо вот этих идеологов, людей вызывают общаться в прокуратуру, ну, людям э, дают штрафы за несанкционированные мероприятия массовые, потому что каждое воскресенье э, люди на ногах и всегда выходят на протест, особенно это видно по Минску. Э, и просто сейчас вся работа заключается в помощи людям, которые вот от этого всего страдают. И хотелось бы, конечно, чтобы, чтобы хотя бы идеологи эти призадумались о том, что, что их ждет дальше, когда власть поменяется, а это случится вскоре, через несколько месяцев, возможно, год. И спасибо большое за то, что есть возможность вообще пообщаться с вами здесь, выслушать вас и рассказать свои проблемы. Um, so at the moment, all our work is uh, focused on protecting trade union members. Uh, for example, one of the um, things we're doing is trying to find um, independent attorneys, uh, lawyers to protect the trade union members, to support them. And perhaps there is a way to enter into an agreement with them, with trade unions as a whole. Um, between the lawyers and the trade unions, a selective trade uh, um, agreement or otherwise. Um, otherwise, um, I just want to say that our work is uh, pretty paralyzed by having to, you know, spread ourselves very thin, including trying to find lawyers who would protect the um, trade union members. And uh, another example of pressure is that some people are not just called to speak to the ideologists, but they also summoned to the prosecutor's office. They're given fines for taking part in the so-called unauthorized mass meetings. And you might have seen in the news that pretty much every Sunday, especially in big towns and in Minsk, people are up and going to a meeting a mass rally and uh, every time there are detentions, like today, it was over 300 people detained, uh, 43 journalists, uh, just to mention that. And um, so it's a constant cycling, uh, cycle of trying to protect the people and to help the workers uh, that suffer from all that. So, and we would like to send a message to those ideologists uh, so that they're also thinking about what's going to come next to them when the power, when um, uh, people at power will change, Lukashenko will go. It might happen in a few months or it might happen in a year, but uh, the ideologists have to think about what's, what's coming next for them. And I just also wanted to uh, thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity to hear you and to tell our stories, and uh, it was uh, extremely useful. Thank you. Okay, Yuri, <coughs> it's really appreciated that you made a real effort to start 
your contribution by speaking English. I think you did really, really well and you just lost confidence there, but you did a great job. So carry on making that effort. And thanks, Elena, for the translation as well. As, as always, really um, fantastic translation service that you're providing for this movement in Belarus. So it's much appreciated. Um, so we're, we're going to move into the discussion phase now. Now, because of the number of speakers, we've, we've gone over the time where we'd normally go into discussion. So I propose that as a minimum, we, we end the meeting at 9.15 and then we'll see how the discussion goes. Um, so uh, the usual thing, if you raising your hands electronically works best for me because I can see. Um, so whilst we're waiting for that, um, Finbar uh, from, from the Ireland Congress of Trade Unions, I believe he wants to speak. So if you'd like to come in, now and other people either raise their hands electronically or do it via the screen and I'll try and spot you. Thank you. Finn, are you coming in? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to express, sorry, I was muted, I hadn't realised that. Uh, I wanted to explain that uh, in Ireland, there's an arrangement between the government, the trade union bureaucracy, and the employers to agree amongst themselves wage rises over a span of perhaps two or three years. They also include other things like conditions of service, health and so on. And that managed then to stifle the rank and file of the trade unions because everything was decided at a central national level. It began as a national pay agreement and ended up over a period of many, many years, perhaps 30 years of this kind of stuff, where they incorporated all kinds of reforms, tax changes and so on. So instead of workers getting a pay rise, the government introduced tax concessions. So the result of all that centralization has been that the shop stewards movement collapsed, the rank and file structures lost relevance, branch meetings began to lose attendances and so on. Now I'm giving that forward as an example to show what can be achieved by the bureaucracy and by the government when they set their minds to it. They also included in this round table discussion the farmers organisations and at one point they brought the NGOs, the non-governmental bodies also into the discussion so they could cover all kinds of issues about social welfare, health, education and so on. After these agreements would have been uh, agreed by the bureaucracy, there would then be a vote amongst the trade unions and the trade unions would be told by their own bureaucrats, if you don't vote for this, you get nothing. And then the workers are often bullied into voting and then the result is that the activity on the ground tends to diminish. And I'm just giving that as an example of what can be achieved by the employers and by the union bureaucracy when they put their mind to it. Strikes then became illegal under these agreements. Now, there were still strikes, some unsuccessful, like an Oster strike, but there was still a, a procedure where it was uh, made illegal. Uh, it was also then agreed from the Union Bureaucracy Industrial Relations Act. Now, the government brought it in, but the Union bureaucrats agreed to it, which made uh, unofficial strikes illegal, which made solidarity strikes illegal. So the consequence of all this, now there have been strikes and some of them have been successful, but by and large, this methodology has been a success from the point of view of the employers and the government. So I just wanted to give that example of what can be done if we're not careful. And the centralization of negotiation means that in Ireland meant that everything was agreed centrally, so nothing could be negotiated locally, and we're still suffering the consequences of these national pay agreements. Sometimes they had grandiose titles like partnership for change and all this kind of stuff, but they were the same thing. It was an agreement between the unions, the government and the employers, to stop rank and file activity. So even though it still goes on, there are still strikes, there are still official strikes. This has had an enormous effect on killing the self steward movement and diminishing the rank and file and the branch activity of union members. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Finn. John Ryman. Okay, so um, 
First of all, I'd like to ask the Belarus comrades, um, they mentioned when, um, when, uh, um, when Lukashenko goes, and I'd be interested if they believe that uh, Tikhonovskaya will be the one to replace him, and if so, or in any case, what is the view within the unions there, and also amongst themselves, of Tikhonovskaya, how do they see her? Um, as far as the United States, well, in the first place, just a general point, that in the end, the power of workers organized on the job, which is to say unions, is in the final analysis, is its ability to stop production. And uh, we have to, unions have to build power um, in order to have to build themselves in the direction of obtaining that power. And in other words, there's no way around in the end being able to wage a successful strike which shuts down production. Um, <clears throat> so, and in the United States, we've had a 75 year now, an 80 year history of a uh, war against, um, against all the fighting traditions and also, which is also tied up with the socialist traditions of the US working class. And that war was waged not only by the, the capitalists through their uh, propaganda and so on, but also by our own union leadership. And the base, there was an objective basis for the largely uh, successful, uh, for that largely successful war. One was the post-war upswing. Another was the role of Stalinism. Um, and it's ironic that now with the end of the post-war upswing, the union bureaucracy has actually become even more conservative, is even more determined to keep a grip on, on its membership and to suppress any tendencies towards militancy, any tendencies towards really fighting back, and is even more determined to maintain the labor management collaboration. And that applies to all wings without exception of the union leadership, including the so-called progressive wing, which will make nice statements that from time to time about political issues and so on, but as far as collaborating with management, as far as making absolutely certain that nothing is done to violate the law by the union and so on, um, there's no real difference between them and the politically conservative wing. And that is, situation has led to massive alienation on the part of the overwhelming majority of the membership here. Now we had, the last time I spoke, there were some people who objected to um, my criticisms of the longshoremen's um, shutting down the ports on Juneteenth. And I was at that. It was a great display of the potential power of the labor movement, but it didn't go beyond that. And here it's been four months since then, there's been absolutely nothing uh, done to build on that potential power, just as I had uh, predicted at the time. Um, and we have to be brutally honest with ourselves. So I think that what's needed is the building of rank, organized rank and file opposition caucuses in the unions. And there's three main points in my opinion. One is to end labor management collaboration and along with that to stop the concessions. Number two, to return to the methods of the 1930s. And number three, to end the rule of the bureaucracy, that all union representatives have to be elected by those uh, they represent, and also that they all have to be on the same wages as the average member that they represent. And there is not one single element that's linked to the bureaucracy, including the so-called progressive bureaucrats, that supports that or that has done, raised the least little finger um, uh, uh, to help to organize that. And I'd like to, in that context, comment on uh, Jane McAlevey, who started out as a loyal union bureaucrat for the AFL-CIO, where she faithfully carried out their orders. She's now with the UCB Labor Studies, and I'm having to speak fairly bluntly here because of time limitations, but truth is the truth. 
um, which the UC, UC Berkeley labor studies, as all these academic labor studies programs are and, and the different uh, universities, it's a coalition between the academics and the bureaucrats. Um, and uh, she had, incidentally, I read her book and it had some interesting history in there. But what you can see if you read between the lines is that what she's interested in is struggling to get union contracts but then making sure that the members don't do anything to upset labor management relations as long as those union contracts are maintained. Um, and incidentally, Kim Moody is a little bit different, but not very much so. So just in conclusion, I think that the massive political crisis that is developing in the United States may be shaking things loose inside the unions. There's been over a thousand strikes, mostly around COVID in the last month or so. And I think all of them, to my knowledge, all of them have been organized by the rank and file with either no participation or the opposition of, of the union leadership. And in that context, you know, I did an interview and I'll finish with this. I did an interview with uh, two uh, union dissidents, union insurgents who were running for office. One of them was uh, Kieran Knudsen, who spoke at a WIN meeting, and the other is uh, uh, Cliff, uh, Cliff Wilming, who many of you comrades know. And um, I I'm gonna post a link to that interview. I think the comrades who haven't heard it will find it very interesting. Thank you, John. Um some interesting comments. Um, David Hempson, please. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, I thank you for all the uh, contributors, but particularly, you know, from uh, those in Belarus, I have to say, uh, again, I'm so impressed, uh, Lisa and Yuri, um, you know, you're in the front line, you're organizing mass strikes. Phew, that's quite a job. Uh, you have to take responsibility for families because, you know, when you lose a comrade and a comrade gets fired, someone's going to have to step up. What about their children? What's going to, where are you going to stay? How are you going to defend yourself against the police? This is all ABC to those who fought in South Africa and throughout the world, you know, to build an independent working class movement. And we know from the scars that we have, you know, just how much it takes, and we've lost so many marvelous people in that struggle. I mean, I, I salute the work that, that you're doing, and I salute the work as well of those who are organizing a most horrendous situation in the gig economy. I just speak as somebody who has organized the dock workers in Durban, where we've moved from, we've moved into liberation. We have the vote. We can vote, hopefully, usefully and carefully, but at the same time as we got our freedom, the bosses got the freedom to fire. And in the docks, we moved from 5,000 full-time workers to 2,000 full-time workers, and the rest all unemployed gig workers. In other words, you take a job, you turn up at five o'clock in the morning, actually more like half past four in the morning, you may or may not get a job. It's tough. You cannot keep your family alive. So it's mainly migrant workers, people who come from rural areas who work, sleep on the, uh, on the streets, and then get ready to work. And I organized those, those workers, and we actually formed a bit of a, something like a cooperative so that we could uh, organize and, and get a minimum wage. And we organized big strikes too. We paralyzed the entire dock system in Durban and throughout South Africa you know, for two days. And that was the biggest strike that has ever been among dock workers in South Africa. It was coordinated. We did, a, you know, we, we fought like that. But then they started fighting back. I won't go into all the details, but the way in which they defined it is that a worker is not actually a worker. You're a contractor. The only way we could catch them was the fact that when our workers were driving uh, their trucks and so forth, if there was a crash, who's responsible? If the, if the goods are damaged, who, who's going to pay? A worker is not a worker, so he's not responsible. Someone else was responsible because that person took a contract. 
Who's the person who gave the contract? So we managed to fight case after case after case to be able to claw back the rights of workers to actually have a proper wage and to have some benefits that we had forced them to pay benefits. Now, I just wanted to mention something else more broadly. A union is a permanent organization of the workers, a defense organization primarily, and we want to see permanent being permanent. In other words, it's not just a strike committee for a day or two. We have to be there as a permanent base for the working class. Its main function, in a sense, is defensive. We have to make sure no one gets fired. Everyone has the job that they've got and that they're going to be able to maintain themselves and to maintain their families in some conditions of decency. The main slogan we have to have is organize the unorganized. And we have a tragic position of which we all need to be ashamed that only nine or 10% of the workers in America are organized in unions. 10% of this massive working class organized in unions, when in the 1950s, it was about between 40 to 50%. The unions are in a shambles. John is quite right to talk about the treachery of the leadership, yes. But the unions are puny things, very pathetic and weak compared to what they should be. And the reason is that part of the reason, at least a big substantial part of that, is that the unions represent so few. Who is organizing the unorganized? Who is building mass trade unions like we saw in the 1930s? And we saw in South Africa in the 1970s, where we started with the two or three, the tens and the fifteens, and now we're talking about hundreds of thousands and we're talking about millions of workers organized. That is the task. Every time I spoke with one of the trade union leaders who, are, who helped us, who helped us young organizers immensely, she would say every, every day to us, how many workers have you organized? And I said, but look, there's this other union and we want to fight with it. We want to get their workers in and to work there. She says, no, 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 I'm not asking about that. How many workers have you organized? She kept insisting on that. But now we have to be clear about that. We are fighting for democratic, independent, working, con worker controlled trade unions. That's what we are really fighting for, no matter what compromises we have to make on the way with every one of those things. When I was in organizing the union, we used to have meetings which would take an hour and a half of our shop stewards, that is to say, ordinary workers who are now becoming worker leaders. Every one of them would have to make a statement about how many workers they had organized and how much money they brought into the union. Only 10 cents a week. But 10 cents a week became thousands and became hundreds of thousands, became millions. That's the basis of the work in which we do. That's where our money's got to come from. From the pockets of the workers. And yet we do know we also need money. We need money for lawyers. We need money to defend workers. What about the worker who's just lost his job and now has got nowhere to stay? We have to think about that. But the, but the money has to come from the workers. We have to be independent financially. We may have accept a grant here or there and elsewhere, but at the end, we have to be honest with the workers and say we are truly independent. And that meant collecting by hand from workers because no employer was going to deduct the money from us for us and hand it over to us. We struggled to be able to get that because we want that flow of money. We need that because we've got to maintain an apparatus. But how to do that? We would have workers collecting thousands and we're dealing with criminal areas where people could get robbed every day. And yet our women organizers would be walking around with the equivalent of $10,000 in plastic bags and actually bringing them into the office and no one would touch them. You touch those women and you're putting your life on the line because we'll get you. And even if I'm the organizer and say, please guys, we don't like heavy stuff. We don't like nasty things happening. Someone would just have a horrible accident in the weekend and that person would be in hospital for a long time. I didn't know, nobody knew how it happened,
but no one touches us when we are organizing for the workers. And we're not terribly sorry if accidents happen now and again. Those things can happen. We'll defend ourselves and we'll do it in every way we can. But we have to fight for small things. In the beginning, we had to fight for lavatory papers in the toilets. We had to fight for towels in the, in the toilets. You could wash your hands and dry your hands. And we fought for that. And people said, what on earth is that way in which you're working? Because that's too pathetic. What is a towel to dry your hands? That's nothing. How about completely liberating everything? Well, of course, we're fighting for freedom. But freedom might start with a towel. Because now you've mentioned that workers are reluctant to join an independent union. But what official union is going to go there and fight for the workers' toilets and clean? People, the workers would say, when we're eating, we have salt and pepper coming from the ceiling because we have the birds shitting on the workers because the, the birds are there in the buildings. That's the way in which the workers had been taken care of by the employers. We fought every one of those workers would join us. If you're going to have clean tables, you join the union. You pay your way because we're fighting for you every step of the way. We have to win the small things, the tiny little finger. Then you get the hand. Then you get the arms. Then you get the body. Now we are moving again and we care nothing for the millions that are on the yellow unions because every one of those people is not a fighter for your union. It's not a defense, not going to stand in defense of those leaders. They're just waiting to pull a ladder from you because that's what you deserve. You deserve to fall on your face. We want those assets from those unions, those yellow unions. When a union is taking money from the workers in terms of subscriptions, that's our money. It's not the state's money. It's not the employer's money. It must come back to the workers so we can control it. When we organize the workers, we wanted to provide benefits because benefits is the foundation of a union in, and under difficult circumstances. In other words, a lawyer, a house, something for which you can, the worker cannot fall down onto the ground. Something is going to cushion them from that, that fall. And the worker said, we want funeral benefits. Funeral benefits. I, was, I, I couldn't believe it. Not health benefits or anything, funeral. But, and I argued with the workers. They said, no, we told you we want funeral benefits. And I said, okay, we'll do that. We took 10 cents, and from that 10 cents, we could put 5 cents down to the funeral benefit. When one worker's child died, it was a girl of only about four years old, the workers assembled, we had thousands of workers, and we made a presentation of something like $2,000 to that worker to be able to bury the child. The workers joined. They say, no, we now understand what you're doing. We will pay the 10 cents, we will get that benefit, and now everyone's joining because we're the only honest organization in the country at that time to be able to provide that for the very poor worker. That worker knows that anyone in the family will die with dignity. We will do that for you, and we will guarantee that. But we must fight against those yellow unions. I cannot believe that they can advertise themselves internationally with the word union. A union, what is a union? If you're, a union is marriage, that is called a union of man and wife. Now, where's the marriage here? Where was the marriage ceremony? No, they are not unions. A union is a voluntary organization. That is the definition of a union. You join it because you don't have to join. You join because you want to join, like a church or any other organization you want to do. And that way we actually know that we're dealing with people who are solid, solidarity, who are solid with each other, support each other because they're not forced to because I will do so. I'm so proud of the movement. If we've got leaders who are women leaders like that, we see it with Lisa, Yuri, nothing against the men, but we must have the women there too. We must develop all the people in the union and to put the women in the front line if necessary, because they'll take it. Jobu's mother I worked with in the 1970s throughout. She taught me 
how to struggle, how not to be shy, how to be bold, how to fight for the workers and not to be shy because I didn't speak my Zulu was not so good, the workers speak Zulu, how to make up for it by being a good fighter and turn, turning out and working hard to fight and fight and fight for the workers. Then you gain the respect, the respect from the workers who are black workers, they will respect you, what skin that you've got because you're there. They saw you yesterday, they saw you a week before, they saw you a year ago, and they know that you're standing for them. We can resolve all those ethnic issues, all the differences that we have in language and so forth, because we are struggling together, and people will never take that respect away from you because you've earned it hard. You've earned it in a hard way. If I could then say, the struggle comes to the point where you have at some points to make some alliances. The workers have faced a dictatorship in Belarus and they have to fight to overthrow dictatorship. It's innate in all human beings that we have to have our freedom. Rousseau said that, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, we have to have the freedom. Every other philosopher has said that and Marx has confirmed that one step further by saying that we have to then be able to live in social democracy in the sense that we have all the means of which to live free. We don't just struggle for the dream of it, we can live it. And that is the dream that we have in, of, of, of socialism. And I think you, we can see that we've got, we will sometimes have to fight together with people that we're not too sure of. To go back to a South African example, one of the politicians during the hard times in South Africa was always saying, well, I'm in favor of trade unions. We would invite him to come and work with us because the workers said, please, if he's there, make it easy for us. Please invite him to come because now we will have 100,000 members and one day they will all come. He never came. He would say it on the, in the newspapers, he would never come. We would find him in the factories going in and out, but he didn't want to stay and talk to the workers. He was a fighter for freedom, that's what he said. Please, you've got to look at the friends, your real friends and the distant friends because they all have to pass the test of time, the test of struggle to see, yes, you're with us, but are you always going to be with us? We are at the base of society. We have to move on and we have to fight intelligently, make alliances at times, but know our true friends are ourselves. We have to train ourselves like you're, you're struggling with English and developing, marvelous, because you're going to be a leader. The person that you've been fighting for is also going to be a leader. We're all going to be leaders. In the sense, in under a workers' democracy, every person will speak for themselves and have the intelligence and the training to do that properly. We need that training. We need that education. We need that development. Because, as the Greeks said, a person who's not political, who is not involved in politics, is a fool. We can be fools and let someone else rule us or we have to rule ourselves. And that is what the unions are providing, the training ground, training tens, hundreds of thousands of workers and shop stewards. And please make sure you do that. Every person right through all the ranks of the organization must be trained. We must give attention to the young workers to the women workers who are frightened to speak, tell them, please, you must speak. You must speak for yourself. I cannot speak for you. You must plead with them and develop them because they will be the leaders and they will astonish us because when they speak, we will stand back and clap because we've never heard such beautiful speeches and such determination for change. I'm sorry to have gone on a bit, but that's just my message to you if I could pass on. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Now, I have to say, I, I was watching the time very carefully, but I think your contribution was excellent in terms of bringing up positive historical examples, saying what is the way forward for the movement and not dwelling on the negative, which really doesn't help us. And, you know, we understand as socialists and Marxists, we understand the, the bureaucracy and where tokenistic actions happen, but it's far better to point to the positive examples to show the potential of our movement, the trade unions. Um, and I just want to raise a question because someone may be able to answer this. I have mentioned before that there are new unions developing and um, I mentioned the 
Industrial Workers, IWGB, and also there's another one called United Voices of the World, where they've organised around, mainly around London, and they've had some really dynamic and successful strikes, where they've done exactly what you asked, David, which is to organise the unorganised. And these are lots of migrant workers where universities have tried to divide and rule, getting rid of the migrants and all of that, but it, and they've succeeded. So my question is to anyone, um, do you think, it, I, I'm in Unite Community because I took early retirement and I saw that Unite Community had potential to be a, a more effective way of uh, bringing together trade unionism and community organising. But United Voices of the World, has anyone had any practical experience of them? Because they offer solidarity membership and I was thinking of also joining them if they do this fantastic work with the unorganised. So that's, I'm throwing out that question. The next speaker is Karel. Okay, I, I want to add some positivity as well because a couple of years ago, um, I was involved as a member of the National Education Union in a very, very big campaign that really kicked off in East London, which was to stop schools becoming privatised. Tony Blair, when he was Prime Minister, and of course, remember, he was a Labour Prime Minister, supposedly, um, uh, allowed schools to become a, a posh term, which is academisation. And of course, a lot of people hear that word academy and thought, oh, that sounds really good. It sounds like I'm sending my, my four-year-old to a, to a grammar school. And um, it was a gravy train, and it still is, it still exists. But in East London, we had some success that really echoed around I mean, it echoed in Parliament. It was mentioned and discussed in Parliament, our campaign. We succeeded in changing the rules <clears throat> of our own union. And um, it was a really big success, but it took a lot of work. So what happened was we had uh, schools in our area, which is very Labour, uh, but right-wing Labour, um, who set out to... Um, privatise themselves, become academies, and um, we had action from uh, uni, the union. And in many schools, primary schools, we had out of, say, 50 teachers, we had, say, five or six members. Well, we worked with those members and we uh, balloted for strike action. And we, we didn't just limit it to um, teachers. We had a big campaign in every single school community. So where the school says it was, where it said it was thinking about academising, um, what we did was we leafleted um, all the roads around the school. Where it was secondary age pupils, we leafleted the pupils outside of the school. And basically we had this massive campaign which culminated really in a very large demonstration, the biggest demonstration seen in sort of 20 odd years in this area, where 500 people marched down our high street and lobbied the council. And the council then had a, um, a statement which said they were opposed to academies. But the big, big impact wasn't that. The big impact was that in every single school, that threatened to academise, we had action and our union grew from very, very small numbers to in, ensuring that every single member of staff became a member of the NEU. Now, the National Education Union used to be the National Union of Teachers, but we succeeded in pressurising the, the leadership of our union to speed up the idea of allowing every single person who worked in a school from the site manager to the cleaners to the cooks to the teaching assistant to the head teacher though we don't encourage heads to be in the NEU uh, particularly but for every person in that school community to be able to join the National Education Union and that happened we sped that up in this area so we had strikes, the strikes were televised. Um, the, bit, the other big thing was that we had hundreds, literally hundreds of parents supporting the union. 
So we'd be outside a school that was on strike. Our leader of our union, who lived fairly locally, would come down and speak uh, in support of us. That some of our local councillors were then forced to support us because they thought they might not be re-elected. And basically, in an area that's 70% uh, black and Asian, um, the biggest, I think, the biggest in the country, we had hundreds of parents uh, on my megaphones, leafleting, um, speaking at rallies and being radicalised. So when COVID hit, we were able to get in, go into action pretty quickly. So we have a WhatsApp group, which is for over 400 members, nearly all women, black women and Asian women, who have organised this WhatsApp group. And we call um, the union members, we call the councillors, um, we call public health officials to account and talk to them. So it's a really been a fantastic campaign. So I was very interested in the, the, the comments that Jade made about the precariat, because a lot of those parents, are the, particularly the males, the dads are minicab drivers, um, Deliveroo drivers, how we work with those people, not only to try to support the unionization, but work and encourage them with, to be part of a community so that when situations happen like um, evictions, that we can then mobilize a whole street. And we have been doing that, but not enough. So I wanna know about building infrastructure uh, outside of the workplace and a, as a way of building a trade union of building a community. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Garel. The It's gone, it's now twen, nearly 20 past nine. We have one more speaker indicating by electronic hand. I'm going to take Trish in a minute, but unless someone else wants to come in and they indicate that, I will wind the meeting up um, after Trish has spoken. Uh, I'll say a few words, unless there's someone who wants to, to, to say a few words just before the end. So Trish, you may be the last speaker. I mean, okay. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. I've really learned so much listening to you all. I wanted to say, really, I feel that the unions have been discredited slowly over the years through my lifetime since the 70s. The unions have had constant attacks from the media, as we'd expect. They've also um, attacked from within. I think there's been a lot of um, corruption within the unions and the union leaders selling the workers short so I think the unions have lost a lot of credibility but on side of that I also think we don't have manufacturing jobs in the way we used to and people would leave school get a job stay in that job or that line of work for their career now that happens with teachers actually and with nurses where they're still pretty well unionized but I think most people work in lots of different jobs through their life so they don't end up defending their kind of trade or or get used to their business as it were they're just doing whatever job they can get at the moment and then they're changing within a couple of years or even a couple of months and some jobs don't employ you for longer now than two years in fact social work in the UK whereas everyone who was a social worker in the UK it would have been it would have been a contract job. Now it's really hard to get a contract job as a social worker. Mostly it's a short contract. Most are working as locums. Even GPs and doctors have turned to locum work. So no one has started to sort of grab a job that they belong to, to create a belonging. And I think maybe coming back to what Jabu said about the um, campaign in Oxford, I think it's really important that we don't just think about workers defending workers' rights, but we pull in other reasons why people are interested in politics or themselves and that is thinking about how do I protect your other rights such as rights on disability rights um, around um, black uh, black lives matter particularly and um, environmental uh, concerns very much so this is what a lot of people are interested in talking about their workers rights if they're only going to work there for 10 months or only going to work there for six months they may be not that bothered but they're probably possibly really really bothered about flooding or the environment or 
in another way, something that matters to them maybe more personally for a longer period of time, so that when they change jobs, they see that the union is defending more than their job, more than their job, but the planet, their, their identity, gay rights, disability, women's rights, you know, against misogyny, against, against other attacks. I think a bit like Jabu's work, in, it's not just about minimum wage, it's also that you get Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion. We need to branch out in unions to pull, to pull people in for different reasons because their trade is no longer something they're defending because a lot of us don't have a trade. I hope that's that's possibly well, not the most positive ending. We should have possibly ended on Corell or David. Apologies. No, that's difficult. fine, Trish. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> that. So um, there's no more electronic hands. Uh, does someone who has not spoken want to come in before I wind up the meeting? Okay. Right. So I'm just going to pick up a few of the themes on, on Belarus. I think um, what that shows is um, trade union density alone is no indicator of a healthy union movement. 96% allegedly in trade unions in Belarus, but if they're state capitalist unions the st uh, and the union leaders are in totally and the employers in the pockets of the state, of, of uh, the dictatorship, if you like, of Lukashenko, then what, it's not really a union as as what we understand it in terms of independent, able to take its own action based on principles of solidarity, it, taking strike action when it when you need to take strike action, and not being thrown in jail for for um, taking up your democratic rights to to withdraw your labour. So you have. You know the comrades in Belarus need to just keep going because you, you will win out because those workers who are in those other so-called unions um, are not going to have find any benefits and the more that the uh, the state capitalists in Belarus turn to uh, neoliberal solutions privatization or whatever the more the workers will be attacked and the and they'll realize that the so-called unions are not doing anything for them. So it's a hard, of course it's hard going, but ever has it been so in the trade union movement. So uh, the other thing is we'll, we'll publicize where to write to, to follow up Yuri's request that we write to the independent unions or the employers and we'll, and we'll send those details around because I know that wind supporters have been doing that anyway, sending through their trade unions messages of support to the independent trade unions, and that's had a, a very positive effect. Um, so we'll provide those details. Um, the other thing is, I, I, as no one took up the issue about the, uh, the, those new unions, I think I'm just gonna uh, join as a solidarity member we will revisit, revisit the subjects of trade unions because it's, it's a live issue that has to be addressed. We are going to face a massive challenge in the trade union movement um, with all these redundancies. And I agree with Trish that we, the unions have to have a wider view of how we organise because if you're trying to talk to workers, let's say precarious workers about the toughness of the job and, and how they should stand together, it may be that their housing conditions are so poor that you know that is another major factor and in fact Jane McElvey talks about that very issue that the union should be really get in there find out what the issues are that affect the lives of workers not only at work because they may be suffering as much or more with certain conditions in their life be it health or whatever and I think it's been taken up that that unions can address the vital issues because David Hempson said that the workers themselves will voice what their concerns are and the union should be responsive to that so I think thinking in the old ways about how unions organize is 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 part of the past um, and we need to be looking at, at different models that are based around organizing and so um, unless someone comes up with 
better authors than Jay McElvey and Ken Moody. I intend to keep promoting that. And I think as long as 90% of what they're saying is, is the right thing about strike action being central to bringing back the strength of workers and um, solidarity and, and uh, issues and that the workers being at the forefront of, of the negotiations, not the bureaucrats, because that's a big, big issue, then those ideas to me are absolutely spot on and I will promote those ideas because we need to promote positive ways forward for the unions to be organised. Um, oh, I'll finish on this point because in Jane McElvey's uh, book, she mentions that it's about finding those natural leaders and actually it is all, it's often a few individuals that have that dynamism, you know, ordinary workers, but, uh, and as Carell found in, when she was involved in the, the, the strikes and the struggle against academization, she found these um, Muslim women, veiled, you can't even see their face, but sometimes they were the most militant and the slogans that they were coming out with were absolutely brilliant in pulling the, the local parents into to show solidarity with the teachers who after all were striking and affecting them in terms of their uh, the children not being in the school so we she says identifying those natural leaders and it's the exact same thing but in its opposite that the Belarusian state is doing because uh, it was said that that these um, ideologists are identifying the same natural leaders or leaders within the trade union movement and trying to nullify them by getting rid of them. So, you know, it is about us as socialists showing solidarity, going on the picket lines, joining unions that are active, that are uh, going into the movement, identifying those leaders and, and, and building them up in terms of uh, the knowledge that we have people like David Hempson, the positive examples about how to, to build a trade union movement in the 21st century and, and trying to organise to win. So on that note, I think I'll leave it there. Roger, do you want to say a few words about next week's meeting? Uh, yes, thank you. Just um, we're, we're dealing with a, um, a country which is uh, almost a failed state. A country where there's uh, huge turmoil uh, and it's called the USA and we've got John Ryman speaking next week on the uh, crisis of the situation in the USA and uh, we're hoping apart from John there's going to be a number of comrades uh, from different parts of the USA participating in that meeting so I think it's going to be another memorable meeting tonight has been fantastic but I say that every time but I'm right <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Um, I do apologise. I left one thing out, and that's rank and file. A comrade in my Labour Party asked me about how that he could support construction workers where the bosses were really exploiting them. And not to go into a long story, but many of you will know that construction in particular, the employers have had the upper hand for decades because of the way they've... Um, subcontract the work out they're not directly employed on by the main contractor so their rights are very low so they have to be more uh, militant and organized and he said well how how can i support this construction worker a friend of his and i contacted um this guy dave smith who you may have heard of who's written a book about the blacklist in construction and he said that there is a very um, active rank and file movement that has developed on in the construction. And um, in one of their initial meetings, uh, when they were taking unofficial strike action, they had um, many thousands of construction workers on strike all over the country. And they were having meetings of 500 construction workers at these rank and file organized meetings. So. You know, it's, it's never a straight trajectory that you build and up and up and up, but it shows the potential that uh, if you use the right approach, 
in the right situation that the, that the unions can uh, defend themselves effectively. So on that positive note, I, I'd like to close the meeting. Thank you.